Hey everyone, this is Achuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology. Happy Monday, everybody. Today we are going to take a look at Mercury's trine to Pluto, which is happening this week as Mercury starts to finally pull off from the very close square to Saturn in Aquarius. And by the end of this week, Venus will also be conjoining Uranus in the sign of Taurus. And as Venus does so, it'll be going very closely over some of the degrees that were active during April 30th solar eclipse in Taurus. So that those are the two major transits of the week. It is a little bit of a slow week otherwise. So the, and these transits don't even happen until the end of the week. However, they will be building as the week goes on. A lot of this is focused on the whole sign house of Taurus in your birth chart. So today we're going to look at this archetypal combination of both the fact that both Mercury trining Pluto from Taurus uh, to Capricorn and Venus conjoining Uranus also in Taurus are taking place. Um, I think later in the week we will be taking a look at the whole sign house of Taurus for all 12 sun and rising sign horoscopes give you a sense of where that Taurian emphasis is happening this week um, with both Mercury and Venus uh, making their aspects uh, from the from the sign of Taurus. That'd be an important thing to look at this week. So we will be doing that. Um, one thing I thought about doing, I'd love to hear your feedback before I actually do it. Uh, in early 2020, right before the pandemic, I did a, I had a, a talk that I did where I invited, I think it was eight astrologers onto a panel and it was called the Saturn Pluto panel. And we talked about what we thought, what we thought might be coming on an archetypal level, given Saturn and Pluto's upcoming conjunction that winter. Of course, that conjunction would go on to tone some of the most dramatic events, um, you know, of, of 2020. And, uh, you know, not a lot needs to be said about what happened in 2020. So many things happened in 2020. Um, but I thought it might be interesting to replay that video and offer a little context at the beginning um, because I was re-listening to it and I was like, it's really interesting to see how all eight of us, or how I think it was eight of us, got it right and, you know, couldn't have, there was a lot of things we didn't see coming or things that we didn't get right. And I just think it's really interesting. For me, it was very interesting to look back on that. Is that something you guys would find interesting? If so, I might do a rewind episode where, you know, I, maybe I'll make a little intro at the beginning, contextualizing it and offering a few thoughts and then let you guys watch it. It was about a two hour talk all on Saturn Pluto in 2020 and I don't know, two years later, I, I was rewatching it and finding it like kind of mind blowing to, to, to see not only in terms of like, I've just grown up a lot in the past two years. I'm sure everyone else has too, but, um, and, and seeing what we all had to say about it. Anyway, don't forget to like, and subscribe, share your comments, click on the notification bell for updates. Once you do subscribe, you can always find a transcript of my daily talks on my website, which is nightlightastrology.com where you can also learn more about my upcoming class, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic. It starts this weekend, everybody. Uh, you have uh, just like six more days left to join. So uh, go on over to my website, nightlightastrology.com. And once you are there, click on the courses page, the first year course, scroll down to learn more about it. There is a video now that we put up that includes some Q&A with alumni that we did recently. You can hear people who recently took the class talking about their experience. It includes 30 live webinars. They're held on Sundays and we meet from noon Eastern time um, to between 2 and 3 p.m. Eastern time every week. They're all two to three hours long. There's 30 webinars on the year. Outside of that, we also have 12 guest lectures and about eight breakout study sessions led by tutoring staff in between major units. There's also a group forum discussion you can ask questions on uh, year round from live tutors that are in that group. You can email me with questions throughout the year at any point in time. You get to keep everything. You have lifetime access to all the recordings. You can download them. So uh, there's a ton of material in the co in the class that allows you to go you know, as far as you want to with the, with the program, if you're hoping to read for other people, you can certainly go that path. Um, if you're looking to slowly absorb the material at your own rate, you can do that. Um, so it's, it's very flexible program. Uh, you have a one year within the very end of the class. So effectively two years total in which to, um, you know, learn the material and take an exam, a certification exam, if you want to, um, 
there is an early bird payment plan that is available up until Saturday. So you have up until the day before class begins to take advantage of that. Just a few more days. If you sign up late, it's not available. So make sure that um, you do so. There's a payment plan. You can stretch things out over 12 months. There's also tuition assistance. So uh, we do have just a few of those left. If you are in need of uh, assistance to be able to take the class, whatever your budgetary constraints might be or special needs that you have with your budget, we're really happy to offer need-based tuition so that you know no one's ever priced out. All right. Well, thank you guys. Um, also, uh, for um, everyone who signed up already, it's been great to be getting to know all of you. We Orientation material has gone out. People are prepping and we're in our discussion forum. People have been getting to know each other. It's been really fun. If you signed up for any reason and haven't heard back from us or you applied and haven't heard back from us, we have emailed back every single person who has emailed us at this point. So email us info at nightlightastrology.com if you need any help. If you signed up through the Kickstarter last year um, and you need help, email us info at nightlightastrology.com um, and we'll be glad to help you. Okay, well, what's the news of the week? It is June 10th and 11th, Mercury in Taurus will trine Pluto in Capricorn. And then on the 11th and 12th, Venus in Taurus will conjoin Uranus in Taurus. So those are the two transits. Let's take a look at them on the real-time clock, and then we're going to give a list of 10 things to watch for, given that these energies will be uh, coming together as the week goes on. So here you can see at the um, outset of the week what's happening. Mercury is just starting to separate, still within one degree of Saturn, just starting to separate from Saturn. And as it does so, it will be moving into the trine with Pluto. And that's what's going to be happening by the 10th and 11th. That's the end of this week. Then you can see at the same time that we also have Venus coming together with Uranus. That will also be happening over the weekend. So these are both energies that are, I would, you know, I would describe them as having their biggest impact Thursday through Sunday of this week. But they are building right now and they're close enough that especially, you know, Mercury's trine with Pluto is already in the engagement range and has been since it turned direct. Um, you're going to be feeling this one. And uh, in even in the next, you know, I'd say even by tomorrow, you're going to start feeling Venus and Uranus coming together and sort of heating up a, a bit more. So, um, yeah, the, both of these energies will be building over the week, which is why we'll also make sure to look at that whole sign house of Taurus, which is where everything is sort of, um, uh, everything is, there's a there's a very strong focus that's going to be there in that area of your birth chart. I'm trying to find my words there. Okay, so what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do now is I want to take a look at 10, arch, 10, 10 archetypal um combinations that arise both from both from Mercury's trying to Pluto in Taurus while Venus is moving to conjoin Uranus in Taurus. The first one I think is really interesting. Um, there was uh, at, at one point in time I heard a speaker and I, I'm sorry because I hate when people do this but I can't remember the person's name because it was years ago but it was someone who was um, someone who was uh, a linguist, they had like a PhD in linguistics and it had written books about linguistics. And um, they were also, um, they had a, a background of some kind in psychedelic medicine or the history of psychedelics in medicine or something like that. And, and they were interested in uh, LSD therapy and, and so forth. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting that they said came to mind when I was looking at this, um, this combination of energies this week. They said that um, they were talking about words and um, this idea, and I think it was obviously this was inspired by, you know, like a, like a, like a psychedelic state of consciousness or, or an altered state of consciousness, but maybe one that could be just as, you know, easily accessed through meditation or a, a deep state of open reflectiveness or something. Either way, they had said that we get as a collective, um, and this was in the early days of social media that I, I remember like Facebook was out and I had heard them say this. 
we get um, we glom onto words like certain words become popular. Like I think, for example, of the word that's been around since I was a kid, which is cool. You know, I don't know. I've said that word probably a million times. You know, cool. Oh, that sounds cool. You know, or um, but but more than that, there are words that become popular. I think right now, for example, of the word stress. I was talking to my wife. We had some friends over. My wife was telling us about the history of the word stress, which she had just learned about. And that, you know, it, it's not like a word that has been um, so widely used um, and sort of popular in the collective uh, until relatively recently. And um, and uh, and then I was thinking about Mercury Saturn, and then I re I remembered this talk. So words like stress or overwhelmed, uh, a word that I see a lot these days is trigger or triggered, um, and many many others. But to to just briefly illustrate his idea, his idea would be that when a word becomes popular, it's because the word is somehow getting at the essence of an experience that everyone immediately recognizes as, as though some, maybe even some experience in the collective that everyone is having or many people are having and it's, it gets named, right? And so then it comes to the level of awareness potentially from the unconscious to a conscious level of awareness. Um, and so then, you know, the word is powerful because it it comes from the the numinous. It's like a, you know, it's like a sparkly fish jumping up out of the deep, you know. And it's like, whoa, look at that's been in there, you know. And everyone kind of like, yes. So, trigger warning at the beginning of a of a video when people are gonna say something or they're gonna say, you know, like I know I listen to a sports podcast and whenever they talk about a controversial topic, they'll say trigger warning as a joke at this point. But it can also be used very seriously to say, oh, we're going to talk about something that's very difficult that may, you know, trigger someone who has who has a sensitivity to that topic that may, they may have a real physical reaction if they hear it. So, you know what I'm saying? Everyone knows this word by now. Um, overwhelm, you know, how many times have I heard the word overwhelm? You know, I don't remember hearing that word like I do now. You know, so, but anyway, the idea is that there's something uh, th about the collective unconscious slash conscious that's at play. There's a dance between the two and what words come up and sort of take power, like words have power. Anyway, and you could think of a million examples. And my point is not to talk about any one word right now. But what he said that I found so interesting, this like uh, PhD researcher linguist was, he had said that they they it's it's amazing because some words will come up and they'll shine a spotlight on something or they will um, illuminate some aspect of experience that were that maybe hasn't been named or articulated well and all of that can be really interesting. He also said that words have collective incantational power, and um, I always remembered I don't remember if that was the phrase he used or not, but it was something like that. And by that he meant like let's say for example the word stress that the more times the word stress is repeated collectively, the more, the more that the, the, that word itself uh, starts to do the very thing to the collective psyche that it sort of imagistically and psychically represents. It's as though the more we uh, use the word stress, the more that there, um, that the, the psychic image of like some some load bearing thing starting to uh, buckle under the load of of a heavy object, for example, like stress on a beam or something, uh, that the more that stress starts to um, sort of sneak its way in, it's as though we get stressed out by the word stress. Um, not, I mean, this is not like a mind shattering idea, right? But I just like the way he had put it. He, you know, we can get overwhelmed by our overwhelm, by our uh, attachment, or um, by the way in which we start, you know, a word that once was numinous and shining with some true experience when it becomes banal, you know, and, and it's sort of uh, every day over a long period of time, we start to get, we are overwhelmed by the very word overwhelm. And it has this weird incantational, like reflexive power. And uh, we're triggered by the word trigger. Like I actually 
heard someone the other day say, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm getting so annoyed when that word comes up and I feel like I want to think of a different word. And, and this person said that they had thought of the word activate. And I was like, okay, you know, I get it. I get the word activate, you know, so you're feeling activated or whatever. But the same thing would happen with the word activated. After a while, we'd all be, you know, walking around feeling overly activated by the word activate. So anyway, long story short, uh, there comes times, there, there, there comes a time in our lives when collective words come up that shine a light on something and a new word sort of sweeps across the, the land. And then there's other times where you know, we need to, he, one of the things that he had said we can do is always, you know, everyone he said needs a thesaurus and, and synonyms. So, you know, the idea behind this would be if you start to feel, you know, overwhelmed, that you would be careful about how much power you give that word over time. You might say, well, I'm feeling a little frazzled today, you know, and, and frazzled has a different feeling and like almost like a different image but you would you would always be careful, in other words, to diversify the language that you use in order to, for example, with the word stress, distribute the stress of the word stress into other words and psychic locales. So the, why am I saying all of this? And I'm sort of laboring this point because what's happening this week, you know, Mercury is pulling off from a square to Saturn, a place where the mind can get fixated, especially on words, language, thoughts, concepts, ideas. And then immediately it's going into a trine with Pluto, where the potential to remake or shift a word, a thought, language, um, an idea can take place. Um, and there can be new life birthed into the way we think or the language that we use. Not that it's always easy to do so, but I see that as a real interesting potential this week. And I thought this would make a good analogy, like a good conceptual, um, you know, a good idea to explain um, how we, and, and something we might use this week. Um, at the same time, Venus is conjoining Uranus and Venus and Uranus also doesn't like to do the same thing over and over. It likes to change the way in which something is done or said or expressed. So think about collective word an incantations. Now that dovetails into number two, which is making something old new again. It's not that you're essentially changing the essence of something, but you may need to change the form or the container. It's sort of like saying, what's that quote from the Bible about, um, you know, you can't put new wine into an old wine skin. I think that's the phrase. Maybe I'm getting that wrong somehow, but you need, um, you, occasionally we need to remake the containers or forms that we put things in. Um, you know, even though it's really about the essence, still, in order to make something old new again, sometimes you need to rearrange the form or structure or the way in which the content is like held. Uh, it's a great time this week, for example, for to run a new series, like a rewind series that I was thinking of doing, throwing in something new over the summer here. Let's do a rewind and I'll replay certain old episodes, which are really interesting to look back at now, given what all that's happened. So, um, that I, as I thought of that, I also thought, oh, that, that fits the astrology of this week. Number three, discovery and invention. So when Saturn, when Mercury is square to Saturn, the potential to be feeling like you're stuck, you can't go somewhere, you can't move. And then suddenly there's this forward movement and the unearthing of a new idea or, um, uh, especially with Mercury, Pluto, the idea of moving off from Saturn into a trine with Pluto could suggest discovering an, an idea, a thought, an approach that frees you up from something that's been blocking you. Um, so discovery and invention, Venus conjoining Uranus also is one that loves to make things new, that loves to um, uh, break out of established habits and patterns. So I think that's a general theme to watch for this week. Number four would be the seeds of sexual or romantic revolution with Venus conjoining Uranus. The idea there is that the conjunction is a seeding moment. So the seeds of some Venusian revolution, could that be sexual, relational, romantic, artistic, etc. Similarly, number five, the seeds of creative or, creative or artistic inspiration, almost where thought and aesthetic come together to for the sake of seeding some kind of change. It's ideas, it's conceptual, it's intellectual, but it's also artistic. And there's so some 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 inspiration, some idea slash 
um, creative vision that might be appearing as the week goes on. Number six would be finding something hidden or revealing a secret. So anytime that you see, um, anytime that you see Mercury hitting an aspect to Pluto, especially a constructive one like this, the potential to reveal something, reveal something that's been hidden, discover something that's unseen, articulate something that's that's been up until this point unable to be articulated or understood. Uh, so finding something hidden, revealing a secret. Venus Uranus is um, a big player in the charts of a lot of my clients when they decide to come out. For example, um, uh, they decide to share for the first time their sexual orientation. And I, I can't tell you how many times, especially looking back upon maybe say teenage years or early 20s or something, uh, different points in time that people may have done that to look and see, oh, look, it was a Uranus Venus transit. Um, so uh, finding something hidden, Mercury, kind of Mercury, uh, Pluto, revealing a secret, Mercury, Pluto, but also. Um, revealing something that you are that is um that it's it's like showing your peacock tail all of its beautiful colors if it's been hidden that's kind of venus uranus with mercury trining pluto number seven would be provocative thoughts ideas communications and desires so provocative venus uranus loves to um do things that are outside of the box so it is venus uranus can be very provocative with Mercury and Pluto, it's not just provocative, something that you're wearing that's provocative or a, you know, a, uh, like a, like a sexual partner you choose that's like interesting or something, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, you could have pro provocative thoughts, ideas, communication, but then couple that also with a unique set of desires, like so some, oh, you know, I'm, I'm longing for, to have, um, some interesting piece of art in my living room <clears throat> or suddenly i'm attracted to very you know bright colorful clothing or something like that um, these are simple examples but anything that is provocative in mind thought aesthetic so the the mercury venus uh placements this week tre both trend toward um being more provocative and edgy and maybe even subversive Number eight would be changing the appearance of something. So for example, any kind of cosmetic surgery or um, the desire to change the appearance of something in a room, like with the furniture or with uh, your branding or marketing or uh, anything, anything that would constitute an aesthetic uh, or physical transformation of appearance. Um, number nine would be conversations about form versus essence, which we've already touched on a little bit, but how necessary is the form in, in, in what role does it play in relation to the essence? I think sometimes in the West, I was talking with two of my mentors about this. Um, in the West, we like, we think it's all essence and that form is sort of irrelevant. Um, I think that, you know, I think a lot about certain hexagrams in the I Ching that really talk about the way that, you know, essence requires form, but the form is sort of the servant of essence. And it's important that there be like a careful matching of the two and a sensitive relationship between the two. And that sort of like the form serves the, serves the essence. Um, yeah. Um, I think about the fact that when Venus comes to be in the world, she is immediately adorned. And, um, uh, and, and so, also, you also think about the form as like um, adornment. And, and so questions this week about form versus essence, how to adorn something, uh, what is the adornment that amplifies the essence or, you know, complements it somehow. These kinds of questions I could see being, you know, very important as the week goes on. Number 10, and this is the one we are going to as kind of a segue into what we'll do as the week goes on is a moment of, of, of breakthrough or a real focus on the Taurus area of your birth chart that relates back to the April 30th solar eclipse, which was happening, uh, you know, sort of 10 to 14 degrees Taurus, which is where Venus is moving through right now. Um, so there's kind of a reawakening of things that have been cooking since the April 30th solar eclipse. And um, 
So we're going to, again, we will sort of revisit that and try to focus on the whole sign house of Taurus, but you could do so already, you know, prior, you know, before I even make my video, just look at the whole sign of Taurus in your birth chart and um, get, a, get a sense for what's been working in that area of my life since the end of April and see how this week sort of maybe um, there's a, there's a sort of critical development this week with regard to um, some of the things that have been happening in your life since late April. So those are some of the things that I've got right now that are on my mind about these transits. Uh, I would love to hear your stories. If you ever have a story, um, be sure to share them by using the hashtag grabbed in the comments section. Uh, the Grahas, the grabbers, the ancient word, one of the ancient words for the planets, uh, they show up and sometimes they sort of, they 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 storm the castle, you know, <laughs> they, they take over. And the series is designed, I do a grab series, we tell stories that you guys share about how the planets showed up. So if you notice something this week, uh, hashtag grabbed or email us grabbed at nightlightastrology.com and, uh, you know, tell us your story. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe, share your comments, click the notification bell for updates. You can always find a transcript of my daily talk on the website nightlightastrology.com. You can also learn more about my upcoming class, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic, starts on June 12th. And don't forget there is a need-based tuition option if that is helpful to you. All right, that's what I've got for today. Hope you guys are having a good one and we will see you uh, for more this week.